ASTAT students. Today we're going to be talking about the normal model. The normal model is the most important model in all of statistics, so uh, let's, let's pay attention this time, shall we? Now, before we can start talking about the normal model, there's something else I want to talk about, and that is rescaling data sets. So let's, uh, let's look. There's a data set right there. Uh, this is a set of record high temperatures in Houston, Texas. What we have here is we have 365 or perhaps 366 data points, one representing each day of the year, and the record high temperature over the last, I think, 50, 60 years. Uh, so uh, here's 106. <laughs> it's got to be during the summertime. Let's hope. Here's a uh, 78. That must be in uh, uh, January or so. Um, those are the. Those are you know. Let's say this were January 15th. That means the record high temperature for that for January 15th is 78. So, um, and we can look at this and we can say, well, okay, uh, this looks like bimodal data. It might be a little difficult to analyze. Uh, but uh, but the main thing that I want to point out to you is most of the world does not uh, um, uh, measure data this way. Most of the world would not look at this and say, oh, the mean is 91.05, the standard deviation is 7.21. The range is 28 degrees. Most of the world would use degrees Celsius. So that means most of the world would be looking at it this way and saying the mean is 32.81 and the standard deviation is 4 and the minimum is 25.56, okay? Because that's, what, that's how most of the world uh, uh, measures temperature. Now, for most of the world, 40 is really, really hot. So the fact that we have 40 over here, that makes perfect sense. So I guess what we could do is we could take all of our data here. We could use the function C equals 5 ninths times F minus 32, because that's how you go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, is you apply this function. And we could get all of our corresponding data points over here. And then we can remeasure all of our mean, standard deviation, minimum, Q1, median, Q3, max, IQR range. Okay? Not necessary. You really don't have to do it that way. Because what you can do is, you can take a lot of these measurements here and just apply the function to it and get the measurements over here. Now, which ones can you do it to? Well, as it turns out, it works for the mean, the minimum, Q1, median, Q3, and maximum. Not the standard deviation, not the IQR, and not the range. Why is that? Well, the mean and the five-point summary, these are, these are measurements of position, okay? I can look on my x-axis and I can say, my mean is 91.05, that means it's right there, okay? I can say the median is 91, that means it's right there. I can point to each of my uh, uh, measurements of position. I can't point to the standard deviation. The standard deviation is a measurement of spread. Same with the IQR, same with the range. Okay? Those are all measurements of how spread out the data are. So, let's think about what's happening when we apply this function here. Okay? What's happening is, we're taking our Fahrenheit data, it's right here, and then we're subtracting 32, so it's just moving over here. What has happened to the spread when we subtracted 32? Nothing. It's still just as spread out as it was before. Then what are we doing? We're multiplying it times 5 ninths. So when you multiply times a number less than 1, it kind of compresses, right? Now what's happening to the spread? It got smaller. So what we're going to do when we're measuring standard deviation, IQR, and range is we're going to multiply times the 5 ninths, but not subtract the 32, okay? For the IQR, you multiply times the 5 ninths. For the range, you multiply times the 5 ninths, but you don't subtract the 32. Now, so basically what I want you to take out of this is, when you're measuring center or any other measurement of position, and you have one variable that depends entirely on the other variable, simply by multiplying or adding, you know, but basically this is a linear function of that, then your new data, okay, the, the, uh, the, the mean, standard deviation, etc., of this new variable, is going to be that exact same function for each of the position measurements. But as far as the measurements of spread go, you're going to multiply, but you're not going to add or subtract. So basically, we have, the, we have this. For, uh, for a data set where 
each of your y's is just a number times each of your x's plus b. That means the mean of your y's will be that same number, your same slope, times the mean of the x's plus b. The standard deviation of the y's will be just the number times, just the multiplier times the standard deviation. Okay? Your b is no longer uh, uh, relevant. And so therefore, the variance of the y's is going to be that same number squared times the original variance. Okay? That's what I want you to take out of that. Now let's talk about the normal model. Oh, hey, before we do that, uh, also notice that uh, for the prior stuff, I had said that this was true for all of our um, uh, the population parameters, like mu and sigma. Okay? Uh, this is also true for our, uh, uh, our sample statistics as well. Okay? So, whether it's parameters or statistics, uh, the, uh, uh, the way that you calculate the mean and the standard deviation is exactly the same. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the normal model. Okay. The normal model is a model. It's theoretical. It's not real. Okay? This histogram here, that's a histogram of actual data. Same with this one, this one, this one. Okay? They're all very close to a particular, a particular model, which is called the normal model, which is this curve right here, this bell-shaped curve that we're all very familiar with. This data set right here is extremely closely uh, 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 aligned to the normal model. Uh, this one over here, not so much so. There's probably fewer data points in this one. Uh, again, this one, fairly, fairly close. Uh, also, this, this is a pretty good one. Basically, any data set that is going to be unimodal and somewhat symmetric, fairly symmetric, you can match fairly closely to a normal model. If you can't, we can monkey with it a little bit to make it match a normal model, and we'll get to that in the future. Okay? So, what is the normal model? Oh, well, first, before we get to that, let's remember what uh, George Box said, and that is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay? So, as you can see from this histogram here, it doesn't match exactly the model, but it gets really, really close. And so, by studying the normal model, we can, uh, we can learn a lot about how to analyze our data. So, now, what is it? It's this bell-shaped curve right there. Here's the function for it, but for God's sakes, don't write that down, because we're never, ever going to use it. So, let's just get rid of it right there. Really, what we're going to do instead is we're going to look at the, uh, uh, the properties of this function. So, What's that in the middle? It's the, uh, it's the mean. There's mu, okay? Now this is symmetric, right? So the mean and the median are exactly the same number. Uh, the standard deviation of a normal model is actually fairly easy to find. What you do is you look at the point of inflection of this curve. So basically, this is concave down, and then this is concave up. The point right in between where it's concave down and concave up is known as a point of inflection. You'll learn about that in calculus. Uh, and it happens to be exactly where the standard deviation is. So here's mu, here's mu plus sigma, here's mu minus sigma. All right? Now, we can just take the standard deviation and move it over and get another standard deviation, and then move it over and get another standard deviation. And what we've basically done here is we've drawn ourselves a nice little x-axis here, going from mu minus 3 sigma, mu minus 2 sigma, mu minus sigma, mu, mu plus sigma, etc., etc. Okay? So, where is all this data? Well, 68% of the data lie within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of the data lie within two standard deviations of the mean. And 99.7% of the data, almost all of it, lie within three standard deviations of the mean. If you got to four or five standard deviations, I think... Uh, uh, less than one one millionth of the data lies outside of five standard deviations. So it's, uh, you, you're going to get pretty much all of it at that point. Okay? That's where your data lie. Now, how can we use this? Well, let's, uh, let's look at some uh, data sets. Let's look at uh, ACT scores. ACT scores are approximately normally distributed with a mean of 21.2 and uh, a uh, um, standard deviation of 4.4. Uh, the way that we write that is we say the scores, and we have a little tilde here, this N stands for normal, with a mean of 21.2, standard deviation of 4.4. It's a little quicker way than writing all that. Uh, so what do we know? Well, we know that 68% of our data lie between 
and uh, 25.6. We know that 16% uh, um, of our data, 16% of our scores are less than 16.8. Uh, now, how do I know that 16% is less than 16.8? Uh, six, well, think about it. 68% of our scores are inside of here, right? That means 32% of our scores are outside of here. It's symmetric, so that means half of the 32%. 16% is over here, and half the 32%, 16% is over here. So you can use that empirical rule, the 90, the 68%, 95%, 99.7%, to get quite a few percentiles uh, around your, your model here. Uh, let's look at the uh, lifespan of high school textbooks. I read that the lifespan of high school textbooks is approximately norm normally distributed with a mean of 9 years and a standard deviation of 2.5 years. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that 16% uh, of our high school textbooks live a longer life than 11.5 years. It tells us that uh, approximately 2.5% of our textbooks live longer than 14 years. How did I get the 2.5%? Same way that I did before. 95% of our data lie within two standard deviations of the mean. That means 5% are on the outside, so you got 2.5% out there and 2.5% out there. So that means that 2.5% of your data lie uh, above two standard deviations above the mean. So 2.5% of all textbooks live longer than 14 years. Um, oh, and then that's the way that we write it, of course. The lifespan is normally distributed with a mean of 9, a standard deviation of 2.5. Okay? Birth weights. The weights of newborn babies are also approximately normally distributed with a mean of 7.6 pounds and a standard deviation of 1.3 pounds. So here's our model for birth weights. And uh, at this point I want to talk about z-scores, okay? This, these are the z-scores, okay? A z-score is merely, it tells you how many standard deviations greater or less than the mean that particular data point is. So this 8.9, if a baby were born that was 8.9 uh, uh, pounds, that baby would have a z-score of 1. Why? Because the baby is exactly one standard deviation above the mean. If the baby were born that, were, uh, that, that weighed 10.2 pounds, z-score of 2. Okay? The way you calculate z-scores, very, very easy. You uh, just take your data point, subtract the mean, so this would be 10.2 minus 7.6, I would get 2.6 divided by the standard deviation. 2.6 divided by 1.3 is 2. Okay? Simple enough, right? So now what I'm wondering is, what about if I wanted to know how many babies are born under 6 pounds? Okay? I look over here and I'd say, ooh, 6. That's not one of my magic numbers here. It's like uh, right in there. Um, so I want to know... What's this area here? Uh, hmm, okay, well that's a little more difficult. First thing I need to do is I need to, I need to calculate the z-score. So I'm going to take this formula here, I'm going to plug in my mean and my standard deviation, so I'm going to get my uh, value minus 7.6 over 1.3, and the value I'm talking about this time is 6. So my z-score is going to be 6 minus 7.6 divided by 1.3, and that's approximately 1.3. Two, three. So what I want to know is, I want to know how many babies are born under 6 pounds, which is equivalent to asking, out of normally distributed data, how much of the data lies under 1.23 standard deviations below the mean. Okay? In other words, what proportion of normally distributed, what proportion of normally distributed data has a z-score of less than negative 1.23, okay? Now, two really easy ways to calculate this. I call them the old-fashioned way and the newfangled way, okay? Here's the old-fashioned way, a table, yes. Okay, so here's table A, which is a table of uh, uh, standard normal probabilities, so it's a standard normal, it's a, it's a, it's a table of z-scores is what it is, okay? And the way you read this is you say, let's uh, look at a close-up piece of this. I want to know what proportion of my data has a z-score of less than uh, negative 1.23.
So what? So which is basically kind of like this little picture right here. I want to go to negative 1.23, and I want to know what how much of the data is right there. So what I do is I find negative 1.2, which is right there, and then I go 0, 1, 2, 3, and it's going to be this number right there, 0 0.1093. So about 11 percent. So what does that tell me? It tells me that about 11% of babies are born under 6 pounds. Okay, that's an answer to exactly what I was asking. All right. Well, let's say I have another question, which is, how many babies are born over 8 pounds? Do the same thing. I'll go to the next page of my table, the page that has the, uh, the positive numbers in it. Uh, oh, first got to calculate the z-score. 8 minus 7.6 divided by 1.3 gets me approximately uh, 0 0.31. So I pull up my table, I get a 0 0.301, and I get 0 0.6217. So does that mean about 62% of babies are born over 8 pounds? No, it does not. Remember, this tells you to the left of. This tells me that about 62% of babies are born under 8 pounds. So that means about 38% are born over 8 pounds. you got to... Be careful about whether you're doing a less than or a greater than here, okay? Um, now, that was uh, the old-fashioned way. Now let's look at the newfangled way, okay? Newfangled way, you use a machine. Use a calculator. Okay, turn that calculator on, and you hit second. This is a TI-83 that I'm using. It's an old calculator, but the TI-84s are just like them. You hit second, uh, and you go to distributions, and what you'll see is number two is a normal CDF. You're going to select that guy right there. And, uh, and then you're going to say negative 99 comma negative 1.23. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying what is the area under the curve that goes from negative 99, basically negative infinity, right? You know, long way over there, up to negative 1.23. And what it tells me is... 0.109348, basically about 11%. Same thing I got before. Okay? And then how would I find the uh, number of babies born over 8 pounds? Well, this time I'm going to do the exact same function, but I'm going to go from 0.31, that's the z-score for 8 pounds, all the way up to positive 99. And what I find is uh, I get about 38%. So I get about 11% of my babies are born under 6 pounds, and about 38% of my babies are born over 8 pounds. The exact same thing I got from the table. The calculator gets you more precision, but as we've said in the past, precision, you don't need that much precision in statistics. You need a fair amount of precision, but not, not, not like calculus, not like algebra. Okay? All right. Uh, last thing that I want to look at is the IQR. The I, this says IRQ. Pretend that says IQR. Uh, the last thing I want to look at is the IQR of birth weights. So, uh, <clears throat> so that means I want to find the birth weights that are in the middle 50%. Now, I know that this is 68% here, so it's going to be something inside of here. So it's going to be less than from uh, 6.3 to 8.9. So le less than 2.6. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe... Two, something like that. Um, how do I do this? Well, there's the old-fashioned way. Grab your uh, your table, and you pull it out, and you say, I need to find Q1 and Q3, right? That's how I find my IQR. So the way that I'm going to find Q1 is I'm going to look at my table inside the table here, not on the margins, but inside the table, and I'm going to find about 0.25, and here it is right there, okay? So this corresponds to um, about negative 0.67 and negative 0.68. So I'm going to say negative 0.675, okay? That's where Q1 is. Now what does that mean? That means that the z-score that corresponds to the first quartile is negative 0.67 or negative 0.68. In other words, the data point that is about, net, about 0.675 Standard deviations below the mean is the first quartile. Now, because this is a symmetric function, that means that the, uh, the data point that is 
0.675 standard deviations above the mean. That, in other words, a z-score of positive 0.675 is going to be Q3. Okay? That's the, uh, the old-fashioned way. Now let's look at the newfangled way. You uh, hit second distribution, and that takes you to this very same page again. But instead of selecting normal CDF, we're going to select inverse norm this time. And we're going to say, what's the inverse norm of 0.25? Getting us our 25th percentile, Q1. And it tells me negative 0.674489. So pretty much what I said, OK? And uh, the inverse norm for 0.75 is going to be positive, exact same number. So how do we get, uh, now, how do we take those numbers, how do we take those z-scores and translate them to birth weights? Well, you use your, uh, your mean and your standard deviation. And, uh, and so you say the uh, first quartile is going to be z-score times standard deviation plus mean, which gets me 6.72. And third quartile is going to be z-score times standard deviation plus mean, which gets me 8.48. And what does that tell me? It tells me that 50% of all babies are born are, uh, between 6.72 and 8.48 pounds. Okay? Giving us an IQ, IQR of 1.76. So the middle 50% of all babies are within 1.76 pounds of each other. Okay? Fairly consistent, I'd say. All right? So, what do, I, what do I want you to take out of this video? You can do things the old-fashioned way. You can do things the newfangled way. It doesn't matter too much. You're going to get fairly good answers either way. Okay? So, whatever, whatever way appeals to you, fine. Do it that way. But what I want you to take out of this is the idea that you can rescale data. You can rescale data to z-scores, which is a good way of standardizing data. And it's a really, really good way of comparing things that are difficult to compare. You take the z-score of one compared to the z-score of another, and now you're comparing apples to apples instead of apples to oranges, okay? Uh, z-scores are going to be fundamental for everything to go forward, so I hope you get a good handle on those, and I'll see you at the next video.